So there's a particular burden on this panel because we're the panel right before lunch. So that oh, means terrible. we need to be extra interesting and I promise you that we are going to rise to that challenge um, this morning. Uh, so thanks to you all for being here. Special thanks to Steve for convening this conversation. I don't know how the rest of you feel, but whenever I get an email from CSIS about an event here, I know I'm going to be coming to something that's very well planned, where there's going to be lots of good information, where it's going to be thought provoking, and where I'm going to leave the room feeling a lot richer for having been here. So Steve, whether it's this discussion today or everything you've been doing on a bowl over many months or the many other issues the center has taken up, thank you for, for giving us this, this opportunity. Um, So we've got a great panel here this morning, and you have their full bios, but I am just going to take a minute to say a word about each of them because they're, they're special people, and we're very fortunate to have them with us today. So here on my immediate right is Dr. Doyen Alawale. Dr. Alawale is the executive director of Pink Ribbon Red Ribbon. She is a pediatrician by training with 25 plus years of experience working in Africa on child health, family health, reproductive health, the, the gamut of issues. Um, she joined Pink Ribbon Red Ribbon about five, six months after it got started in sort of early 2012, and she's really been guiding the effort ever since. So with Doyen is Dr. Kennedy Lashimpi. Um, Dr. Kennedy is the director of the National Disease Cancer Hospital in Lusaka, which is the premier cancer treatment center in Zambia. I've actually had the privilege of visiting there, and I can tell you that it is very much on the front lines of doing what we're talking about today, that Dr. lashimpi has been very innovative in looking for partners and different ways of doing business that can really improve the kind of service he can provide to, to the clients at his hospital. So Dr. Lashimpi, thank you. You've come a very long way. You were in Texas anyway this week, but you've come here today, which is great, um, and your perspective is really very critical to the conversation. Um, and then we also have Sandy Thurman um, with us this morning, who I know many of you know. Sandy's the um, Chief Strategic Information, I didn't get that right, sorry, Chief Strategy Officer. Chief Strategy Officer at the Office of the U.S. Global AIDS Coordinator, um, and has also had a very distinguished career, um, was the Director of the White House Office of National AIDS Policy in the White House, um, founded the International AIDS Trust, is a professor at Emory University, and has done many other um, significant and important, con many other significant and important contributions to both the global and the domestic AIDS um, epidemic. So we want to get started with the panel, um, but I did think I'd just say a, a word or two um, as, we, as we move from the discussion of the prior panel to this one, which is a little bit of a different focus, um, about some of the things I think we need to keep in the back of our mind as we talk this morning. And I think there, there are issues that have sort of percolated to the service already, but I think it's just good to be reminded of them. And they've really struck me in the time that I've been engaged with Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon. I've, I've been a part of the group since the start in um, 2011 and have had the opportunity to work closely with, with Doyen and the Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon team and to travel and visit almost all the sites where Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon is working. And there's four or five kind of key impressions that have really stuck with me. Um, you know, the first is, this is a disease, and we've heard this in the Q&A already, that in Africa is still very much a silent killer. You know, too many women are being diagnosed much too late for this to be able to make a difference um, to them. Secondly, it's very highly stigmatized. There is a lot of fear and a lot of misconception about cervical cancer and other cancers, um, certainly in Africa. I make it a practice when I travel to ask women that I meet with what is more um, difficult for them to hear, a diagnosis of HIV or a diagnosis of cancer. And I'm always amazed by the number of people that answer cancer. So I think that actually says a lot, you know. Um, we know that this is a condition that affects HIV positive women much more than anyone else. If you're HIV positive and you're a woman, you're four to five times more likely to develop cervical cancer. We know that it's a condition that's infecting young women ever more acutely. Um, and in a much more serious way than I think over the prior five or 10 year period. And we know that the burden of the disease is growing. And I think according to WHO statistics, um, I think in 2013 for the first time, the number of deaths um, due to cervical cancer exceeded the number of deaths due to maternal related conditions. So that's a very important fact, I think, for us to keep in the back of our mind. And that's project, that trend is projected to, to grow and expand at, at an alarming rate, actually. Um, so I think to start this morning, we actually have um, 
a short clip, just two minutes, that we want to share with you all. It's from a video that was developed by the Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon Secretariat, and I think it um, will help us think a little bit about those issues I just flagged and also understand a little bit the human dimension of what we're talking about today. So if we could just start with that clip, that would be great. I'm sure it's coming. So this is not this is not the right clip. So why don't we this, this is okay, good, sorry. <laughs> so that's a that's a very powerful, I think, reminder of some of the issues we want to try to discuss today. And the full um, uh, clip, it's only about 10 minutes, is available on the Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon website. I'd really urge you all to try to see it. There's an awful lot of very good information there. Um, but but Doi and I, I want to turn to you now, OK, to um, ask you to tell us a little bit more about what Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon is doing to help women like Evelyn, and then also to tell us a little bit about um, how President and Mrs. Bush came to be engaged with the effort. So. Uh, thank you very much, um, Lisa, and thanks to CSIS for inviting us to this meeting. Let me just say that within a month of the diagnosis, Evelyn died. And she left behind six children and an aged mother. Every year, there are approximately 60,000 Evelyns in sub-Saharan Africa. And because of this magnitude of the problem and the association with HIV, that actually kept President and Mrs. Bush thinking back on what they had started in 2003. You all recall that in 2003, President Bush signed the bill that established the US President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. It was a $15 billion Congress approval, which of course has now grown to $59 billion. But it started and provided access to treatment for people who were suffering from HIV. As a result of the work of PEPFA and the generosity of the American people, 7.7 .7 million people today have access 
to antiretrovirals. The downside to that is that HIV wears the face of a woman, and therefore, women who are now living with HIV, surviving, and the children that were born and have access to ARTs are now getting to adolescent, becoming adult, but they are now so very much susceptible to HPV infection. So what we are seeing is women who are HIV positive in their 20s, 30s, coming down with cervical cancer. I'll give a typical story of a 19-year-old girl who presented in one of the pink ribbon, red ribbon countries with stage four cervical cancer. She was found to be HIV positive. When I was in medical school in the 70s, if you diagnosed a case in a 19-year-old as cervical cancer, my professor would probably give you a straight F because this was a disease of the elderly. So now that we're having a lot of women surviving HIV, four to five times more susceptible to HPV infection and cervical cancer, this led President and Mrs. Bush to say, we must not lose all of the investments that we have made into HIV. And he said, it is unacceptable to save a woman from dying from HIV, only to have her die from a preventable cervical cancer. That is the raising death of pink ribbon, red ribbon in September 2011. And therefore, this pink ribbon, red ribbon is a public-private partnership that catalyzes the global community to reduce deaths from cervical cancer and breast cancer. Why did we add on breast cancer? Because the two are the two leading causes of cancer deaths in women in sub-Saharan Africa. And in order to make sure that this does not become another epidemic on us, Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon is working with countries in developing countries of sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America to raise awareness of the disease as well as provide access to early detection, treatment, to make sure that women do not die from these diseases. And that's how Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon came to be. Dorian, thanks. Can you say a word or two about how the partnership works? The partnership engages with countries. We select our countries deliberately using certain criteria. The country has to be one that has prioritized women's cancer, that has high political commitment right up to the first lady, the president or prime minister, and of course is ready to put its own resources into it. It's a country that welcomes pink ribbon, red ribbon's engagement and identifies us as partners, not as a substitute for government, and is willing to, of course, work hand in hand with us to make things happen, to make a difference in the lives of the women. It's a country that is secure and safe. And finally, it's a country that has at least one cancer treatment center. We do this because we believe it is not appropriate for us to screen women Find those who may have disease. Yes, you can treat some with cryotherapy, with lip, but those who have suspicious cancer, and you say, sorry, there is nothing we can do. Or you have to go to another country. A woman who does not have money to, work, to travel from a rural area to the capital city is unlikely to be able to make it to the next country. And so we make sure there's at least one cancer treatment center. So when we get into the country, we engage with them and align with the country's own plan. We do not come from the United States with a plan of our own to hand over to governments. We ask for their national policy, strategy, their plan. We identify who the partners are, what is government doing in this area, and we identify what the gaps are. 
from the gaps, we are able to say these are the ones that pink ribbon, red ribbon will fulfill. We do promote the entire continuum of cancer care from prevention to palliative care or what you can say from vaccine to morphine to make sure that we provide a comprehensive cervical cancer, breast cancer programming. We leverage existing HIV platforms because, again, HIV-positive women are more prone to HPV and cervical cancer, and therefore, they are the more susceptible, and we go for them first. But we also use all points of contact, family planning clinics, outpatient clinics, maternal health clinics, to access women. We work within the existing health structures, and we are helping countries to ensure that data concerning cervical and breast cancer are also incorporated into their health management information system. We help to build capacity right from prevention from community level health workers right through to cancer diseases hospital where uh, capacity is required for pathology, for surgery, for oncology. We help to build capacity across the continuum of care, just to make sure that the country is able to provide quality services to its women. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Doyen. And, and Kennedy, of course, you um, were one of the first countries, Zambia is one of the first countries, and you were one of the first partners to work with Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon, and you're on the front lines of this issue every day. So I wonder if you could maybe tell us about two things. Um, first, just your experience. What, what are the daily challenges like that, that you face and your colleagues face in dealing with cervical cancer and diagnosis and the continuum of care in Lusaka in the hospital that you're involved with? And then maybe also a little bit about what pink ribbon, red ribbon has meant, what it has brought to you in terms of um, added value. Right. Um, may I also say thank you very much for uh, having invited uh, me to come and uh, be part of this uh, discussion this morning. Um, I come from Zambia. It's in the southern central parts of uh, Africa. And uh, we are a population of 14 million people. And about 52% of that population is women. Uh, and. Uh, 60% of this population is uh, under 15 years of age. So we are a growing population. And our HIV prevalence rate is at 14% on average in the country. There are some uh, areas that are higher and there are some areas that are lower. Um, in terms of uh, how we came to, to start a cancer service in our country, it all started by noticing an increase in the number of cancer, cancer diagnoses that were being made in our pathology labs in our country. And by 2004, we had about 5,000 confirmed cancer cases waiting to go for radiotherapy abroad. And for each of these, we needed to spend something close to 10,000 US dollars equivalent to send one patient for radiotherapy to South Africa. And the uh, government only managed to send about 350 patients in that year. And you can imagine what could have happened to the rest of, the, of, of, of those patients. And the majority of these patients were cervical cancer patients at about 35%. And if you really imagine, this is a disease that can be easily be prevented and can easily be treated and curable if diagnosed early. So because of all this, uh, government had to make a decision to start uh, screening services and to start uh, treatment uh, services for cancer in Zambia. And so in 2006, this year marked a turning point for Zambia in the sense that we did establish a screening program and we established a treatment center for patients with cancer in Zambia. The cervical cancer screening program uh, started with a one American professor of gynecology, uh, Grusbeck Parham, who came from UAB and visited the country to just come and see Victoria Falls. And at that time, he met some of us, and he saw the idea of, of trying to establish a cervical cancer screening program. 
and uh, we, we agreed, and that started. We use the NEST-led-based uh, screening program, uh, a see and treat. You see the patient. If you find they have problems, you treat with cryotherapy. And uh, for those that have uh, a bigger lesions at cryo, these are the ones we triage for lip. And as soon as you do lip, you send it for histopath, and we confirm whether this is just a CIN3 or there is an invasive component, with which if you find invasive component, they are then referred to, to our clinic. So when we started, it was quite small. And it was supported, of course, by PEPFAR funds, and we targeted only HIV-positive women. By the year it was 2008, 2009, the pressure from HIV negative women was increasing to get screening. And uh, by the time um, 2010 came, our clinics had to be opened up for HIV negative women to come for screening as well. And this is where pink ribbon, red ribbon came and made it a, such a significant difference because in 2011, uh, President Bush came and launched the, the initiative in Zambia in our hospital. And uh, we had such a boost that uh, we, we, we now started looking forward to, to spread, uh, to, to, to make available the screening services in all the provinces of Zambia. Zambia has 10 provinces, and when we started, we were only in Lusaka. And from these nine provinces, at current moment, we now have about 40 clinics, and we have screened over 200,000 women for cervical cancer. And we have treated over 40,000 women with uh, proven cervical cancer at our center in Zambia. So these are some of the, the things that we're doing. Despite all this, we have a lot of challenges that we face on a daily basis. And the greatest challenge sitting in Zambia and seeing patients is late presentation, um, something that probably advanced countries don't see that often. But our patients, when you, are when you diagnose them with cancer today in Zambia, 60% of them already are stage three and four because the screening programs are just starting. And this, of course, uh, brings down the survival rate uh, to, to, to um, uh, very low figures. And, uh, we, we fortunately have already created a very good palliative care program in the HIV era, which is now benefiting the cancer patients that are being uh, uh, seen. The next thing is the high mortality from the cancers that we have. Both breast and cervical cancer in Zambia have very high mortality rates. So we need to actually uh, think more clearly on how to reduce the mortality from these. And then we are very few in terms of trained personnel that are uh, able to actually recognize uh, cancer in Zambia and be able to treat whether the pre-malignant lesions or the invasive cancers themselves. Then, of course, we are struggling to make these services available at national level so that we make meaning and we make sense to the communities that we serve. With the assistance of the international community. International Atomic Energy Agency was the first to step in and uh, assist Zambia to create uh, the treatment programs and train a few staff to, to actually manage cancer. With the coming in of the pink ribbon, red ribbon, this has had a multiplier effect. The IAEA, WHO, pink ribbon, red ribbon have all assisted Zambia to actually come up now with a national cancer control strategic plan which has prioritized cervical cancer as one of the cancers that we need to pay attention to. And I'm sure by next week, our Minister of Health will be signing this uh, National Cancer Strategic Plan for Zambia. And this, through the years that we've been trying to build it, it has increased a lot of awareness among us, the, the Zambians, and women have actually accepted uh, the, the, these services, they, they are now beginning to come voluntarily for screening. Our clinics see not less than 40 patients in one day, you know, and uh, the nurses are so overwhelmed. And we have recently, last two years, been doing the HPV demonstration project 
thanks to the Pink Ribbon Red Ribbon Alliance that provided the free vaccines for 50,000 girls. And we completed that. When I was looking at the data from UK, we had 90% coverage, first dose. Second dose, around 86. The third dose dropped to about 65% for several reasons, and uh, which we are now beginning to look at to learn a few things. We also did a school-based uh, vaccine program. And um, we are now, like I've already said, uh, scaling up these services so that they are accessible to the population in Zambia. Pivotal to all this is the, the involvement of the president and the first lady, the minister of health. In Zambia, we have a unique situation where the first lady was a gynecologist, minister of health gynecologist, permanent secretary for minister of health gynecologist, the permanent secretary <laughs> and the minister for community development were both gynecologists. <laughs> so it was quite easy for us to put these things together from community to you know, uh, so we, we, we were in a unique situation, and I think that's why President Bush identified, along with the peace that we have in Zambia, uh, stable elections and uh, transparency, to actually launch these uh, programs in Zambia, along with the Zambian government. I think that's, that's what has. Thank you. Thank you, Kennedy. That's a, great, that's a great overview. And I think maybe we'll come back to this issue around scale-up, because that's a huge challenge and be good to hear a little bit more about how that's moved forward in Zambia. But you know, I think hearing you talk about the political leadership and how you all very cleverly infiltrated the leadership with people who would be advocates you know, across um, you know, the various um, Zambian structures is quite a good strategy. Um, so, and, and Dr. Lashimpi also himself has been a real leader on this. He, he won't say that, but it's good for, I think people need to know that also. Um, but I, I think we should maybe go to Sandy and talk a little bit about political leadership here, you know, in this country. And I was um, at the launch of Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon in 2011 here in Washington, where former President Bush and then Secretary Clinton and a number of other leaders came together to actually launch this initiative with, with a, a high profile and a, a lot of commitment. And I know Secretary Kerry has also picked this up and said he wants to approach the um, the fight against cervical cancer the same way the U.S. has, has led the fight against um, global HIV. So it would be great to hear a little bit from you, Sandy, about um, why Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon is so critical to, to PEPFAR, how you're thinking about it, its, its future support. Sure. Thank you, Lisa. Um, well, first of all, let me just um, send you all greetings from Ambassador Burks, who couldn't be here today. Um, she's uh, in the process of completing our first rounds of um, uh, country operating plans for PEPFAR. And, you know, as wonderful as it is to have a little bit of money uh, to give away uh, and to, to program as we do in PEPFAR, um, it's not as easy as it looks. And so she's uh, deep in the weeds today in Atlanta at CDC trying to, to finish this first round, so she sends, um, sends her greetings to you all. Um, PEPFAR, I think, was, was um, a perfect match for Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon, uh, from the beginning, uh, because you know, PEPFAR is the largest single-focused public health program of its kind, um, and uh, is programming about $6 billion um, a year. And the majority of our work is in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and has enjoyed, the program has enjoyed extraordinary uh, support and leadership uh, politically across the board, Democrats and Republicans, um, President, sorry, with President uh, Bush, absolutely supported um, enthusiastically by President Obama, and now, of course, by uh, Secretary Clinton and uh, former Secretary Clinton and uh, Secretary Kerry. What we've been able to do over the life of PEPFAR is really build extraordinary infrastructure um, on the ground and a sound platform um, that supports activities like uh, Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon, and programming like Pink Ribbon, uh, Red Ribbon. And um, so we think it's a natural um, to just build on an existing platform instead of recreating the wheel, to look at you know, finding um, more integrated approaches and interdisciplinary approaches to um, cervical cancer and breast cancer, HIV and AIDS, uh, than we have had in the past to create a continuum of care, particularly for women, um, which is another reason that Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon is a great uh, partnership for PEPFAR, because uh, the majority of people living 
living, as you've heard, living with HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa. The majority of our clients are women. Um, and our focus um, and our redoubled efforts are targeting uh, women in this next phase of, of uh, PEPFAR. And we've had um, some extraordinary successes in the program, but still challenges around reaching women and reducing new infections, um, and young women in particular, so that our target audiences are the same, women of childbearing um, age and young women who we can um, uh, immunize and get into a continuum of care early. Um, the other thing is that we have common interventions and, and, and again, priorities, women, voluntary male circumcision, um, you know, building, getting people into care, retaining them in care, all those kinds of things that we both need to do, addressing uh, HIV and, um, uh, and uh, cervical cancer. But the other is um, that we've had an enormous amount of experience in HIV over the past 30 some odd years in um, addressing and reducing stigma and discrimination around HIV. Um, and we've got the same challenges in cancer and cervical cancer and breast cancer in particular um, to you know, reduce stigma and to get people to, to seek treatment um, early on. So um, we feel like we have lessons that have been learned that we can share and, and new opportunities to learn and do our jobs better um, in making our services available um, to people in a way that um, uh, they engage more in you know, healthcare seeking behavior. So we think that's um, really, really uh, important. And I think the other thing is that um, it is targeting particular populations and hard to reach populations. We've, you know, we've invested a lot of time and effort um, in HIV and AIDS. I know we have in cancer as well um, and targeting people and getting them into treatment. I think there's a lot we can share and we are sharing that helps us do our, our work um, better. And the other is this idea of, of the continuum of care that starts uh, very, very early on. And um, as we were saying from, um, you know, from the very beginning, in preventive care all the way to the end in palliative care. And um, we've been doing this um, side by side for years in the, in the HIV world and the, the uh, uh, cancer world. And so we share that um, need to figure out how we do both of those things more um, effectively. So I think it was a natural partnership. Um, our priorities are, are very, very closely um, aligned, and, um, and I think Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon really is an extraordinary example of how a public-private partnership um, can, can help us reach people, um, engage political leadership, find resources to fill in the gaps, you know, identify gaps, work together to, to uh, fill them. Um, it's, it's about as good as, as any I've seen, so we, we love being part of it. Well, thank you. Thanks, Sandy. And I think we'll come back um, when we have a few minutes to what's unique about the Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon partnership. But I think maybe first just to follow up on these issues around scale up, which I think are so critical and so challenging. And, you know, Sandy, you mentioned the demographic cohort of young women and girls that actually I know the Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon Secretary has done an analysis of what that looks like in the five Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon countries. And it's substantial and it requires careful consideration. Um, Kennedy, you, you mentioned the success in Zambia of actually pushing the screening out to the nine provinces. So I, I actually like each of you to, to think a little bit and respond around this question on scale up, you know, and, and what do we need to be thinking about now so that five and 10 years from now we're able to get these services, the screening, HPV, out to this ever expanding cohort of young women who are going to need that kind of care. So maybe we could start with you, Kennedy, just to give us a little more insights into in Zambia, how you actually managed to go for a fairly small number of centers that could actually do VIA screening to a, a much more expansive network and what that required. Um, I think the, the most important thing is to, um, us as a clinicians, to, to ensure that we have uh, put our case properly to the decision makers, in, in meaning the politicians and the, the people with money in the country, and the people who assist us to look for money. Um, the most powerful thing that we have used is to look at women as the economic drivers of, of the economy of Zambia. Because today in Zambia, if 
uh, most of the households depend on, on women, actually. And when you lose a woman, even if the male a parent is there, there is a, there is a negative effect on, the, on, the, on, on that family that begins to be seen. So you package these sort of things to, to those who can understand economics so that they help you to look for the money. And more so, to ensure that we don't lose the focus on the effect of mortality that the cervical cancer is creating. And that we have, we have come this far from the time we started uh, antiretrovirals in 2000 up to now, and we keep on losing so many women. And when you put it in numbers, in absolute numbers, you find that the, the people who look at the problem begin to see it differently. And so this helped us, and then we had uh, a very strong awareness program that started, and we trained quite a number of community health workers to actually spread the information and spread the news into the communities. And this created demand from the community-based uh, NGOs to try and now foster governments to begin to establish these uh, services in the communities where they live. And it came also with a, the change of governments in 2011, where a community-based approach was now emphasized by the new government that took over. So you see, we were just at the right time, uh, in time, for, for, for these services to start uh, uh, getting uh, uh, scaled up. So we, we used the political will that was there, and we used the, the partners that came on board uh, that provided financing for us to scale up, but we knew what we wanted to do as a country. So we had a, a, a map, but we needed to, <clears throat> to, to have somebody come in with money so that we can begin to, to actually scale up these programs. And the most important was to emphasize that this is a low-cost intervention. Low-cost, but very effective. And when we believed in that and we agreed this is what we are going to do, we then designed the courses that will go with this. We identified the sort of equipment that we need. We costed the plan. And when Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon came, these things were already there. And when they brought the money, it was easy for us then to go. And we had already even identified where we are going to go next if money was available. So this is something that other countries should actually look at and begin to prepare just in case you have somebody coming and say, what do you want to do? Here is the money, so where do you want to go? Then you begin to say, okay, uh, no, uh, let's discuss. That sort of thing is not nice for people bringing you help. So you need to actually plan yourselves as a country and begin to understand what is the next step that you need to do in case money is available. So this is, this is the most important, I think, is the planning. No, absolutely. Dwayne, maybe you could say a few words about how in countries other than Zambia, um, Pink Ribbon Reverend is thinking about the sustainability and the scale-up issues and trying to work with those governments on similar kinds of challenges. Yes. Um, when we did the analysis, if we were to go by the fixed facilities that wait for women to seek care, it would take us more than two decades to be able to reach the 80% goal that WHO says every country should attain. And therefore, we had to think innovatively. The first thing was we need to begin to take services out to the women. So we started promoting in all our countries not only fixed facilities, but outreaches, mass screening campaigns. Take, for example, last year, during the International Women's Day, we supported Tanzania with the leadership of the First Lady who went ahead and mobilized the communities. Over 12,000 men, women, and adolescents turned up in Wanza region just in one day because Mama Kikwete was present. And within a two-day period, the Medical Women's Association of Tanzania were able, all hands on, to screen over 3,800 women on site and to screen over 5,200 women for breast cancer. And subsequently, the, the services continued 
in the nearby facilities for those who could not be attended to. So getting services out there rather than waiting for the women to come. And even that approach, we have tried to sustain with one of our partners, Project Concern International, PCI, that is working in Zambia. With the help of Airborne Lifeline, one of our partners, they go on outreaches, they are air freighted by Airborne Lifeline to different military positions and to the villages around, and they actually take services out on a regular basis. The second thing is we are also considering innovative treatment approaches. It's become very cumbersome working with the conventional crowd therapy machine and gas cylinders. Not only have they become expensive, but cumbersome, they also leak because you transport them by road. And therefore, we are working closely with a company in Texas, Cryopen, to develop gasless cryotherapy. We're happy that NCI has given them the empowerment to go ahead and develop this gasless cryotherapy machine that can use electricity, but even when electricity is not available, can use three car batteries to operate. And they are now developing a very robust uh, model of it that can be portable and carried out to different uh, locations. One of our partners, Kyagen, has developed HPV DNA testing. And this is something that will reduce the load on visual inspection with acetic acid. And so we are already in discussions with Zambia, with Botswana, and Tanzania to first of all screen these women using HPV DNA as a triage because we know that 80 to 85% of the women will be negative. So you are only left with 15 to 20% of the women that would need to go through VIA, possibly cryo, leap, and subsequent treatment. Once this is in place, we know that we'll be able to reach more women more rapidly. Mobile technology is something else that we're looking at to remind women of appointments, to send out messages. In Tanzania, we're working with the Tanzania Youth Alliance. In the past year, they sent out 800,000 SMS messages to 40,000 subscribers. Out of this, 18,000 women were actually referred for screening. So these are methods that we are getting out there to be able to reach more women more rapidly. But at the end of the day, HPV vaccination is the way to go. And we are already working with Zambia, with Botswana, to make sure that this happens. Thanks to the generosity of Merck vaccine, we were able to supply uh, to donate vaccines to Botswana. They've been able in the first two years to vaccinate over 8,000 girls. And together with Zambia, the two countries have vaccinated over 42,000 girls. And this year, Botswana has now assumed responsibility with its own budget, with its own implementation uh, services to deliver nationwide rollout HPV vaccination. So these are some of the methods that we're looking at, not forgetting data management. We're working with each of the countries to make sure that right from community level, right through to cancer uh, centers, we have data that would exactly tell us how many women we're reaching, how many we're missing, who is there, who needs care, and who needs to be followed up. No, thanks, Doyen. That was a great and, and very concrete answer, because you really helped us kind of see what, what's going on. And I think it also speaks a little bit um, to the value of these kinds of public-private partnerships. You know, I'm working very closely with national governments, with civil society leadership in countries, is that you have this mix of perspectives that collectively is going to problem-solve differently 
than anybody would do individually. And I think we, we've seen that in some of these more innovative approaches now that the Pink Ribbon Red Ribbon Partnership is exploring. Um, so I want to come back to the panel before we leave and go to lunch, but I think it would be good maybe to open the floor for questions for like the next 10 or 15 minutes. We'll see what, what's good. Um, but, but just for the panelists, I think just to, to um, follow up on where Doyen just left us, I think if you could just think about you know, public-private partnerships, this is the opportunity this panel to speak about them in this space today. You know, if you could say a little bit about why you think this is a unique and effective way to work, why this kind of partnership can really help move the, move the agenda forward in a way that we can if we're just working alone. I think that might be a good just last question to come back for a few minutes on. But, but let's open the floor um, and hear from some of you. And as, as folks have asked before, if you could just please identify yourself. And why don't we start right here with the lady in the picture. And we'll do maybe three questions at a time so we can go here and then over here and then to the gentleman in the back, okay? Thank you, Lisa, I appreciate mm -hmm. it. I just wanted to ask, to go back to this question of scale. My name is Sarah Goltz, I'm here representing Cervical Cancer Action. We've had a chance to work with many of you over the last eight years. How have you handled the, the issue of quality? Because you've certainly, you've certainly tackled the, the question of scale and pace, which is a huge challenge for us. But we know from many of our other colleagues that particularly with visual inspection, it's not just a question of getting the program going, but making sure over a period of time that those who are applying the services are doing so as effectively as possible in some really challenging settings. So how, how, what would you say to others who are establishing programs in order to monitor those and to really assume that we're having the impact that we have the intention of having? Thank you. And let's take the question right here, please. Um, I'd like to echo the same question about quality and quality control uh, with, with the current screening approaches, but also we know that with some of these cost-effective screening approaches, there is a caveat, which is that there perhaps will be more cryotherapy done than is potentially needed, and how do you deal with that in terms of programmatic success, because that too, as you scale, can have implications and on the overall cost of the program. Mm -hmm. And the gentleman in the back here. My name is Joe Mando from the American Cancer Society. Um, first, I just want to uh, commend Zambia for doing such a great job, as it always does in many other areas. But my question is for Sandra. Um, I want to build on your sentiment that uh, Ambassador Bex is uh, facilitating the CARP process, which is the country operating plans. And as part of that, I think, uh, countries are having to refocus their, strategically refocus their resources to where the epidemic is, and part of that means um, prioritizing their interventions um, with the ones that have the most impact on the epidemic into core, near core, and non-core. And subsequently, or consequently, uh, cervical cancer is being categorized as non-core because it does not directly impact uh, HIV epidemic. Um, could you speak to uh, the future of the PEPFAR contribution to, the, uh, to cervical cancer given uh, that? Great. So let's take those three questions first, and then I know there are others, so we'll come back to them in the next round. So um, the, I, I think the first two questions were a bit similar about um, quality and um, issues around um, maybe false positives and cost implications there. So uh, I don't know who would like to take that first. No. I'll start. Mm -hmm. So how do we handle quality control? One of the first things that Pink Ribbon Red Ribbon did when we first engaged in Zambia was to uh, provide resources to develop what we call an electronic hub room within Lusaka. It's based within the Center for Infectious Diseases Research. In the early days before we came on board, Center for Diseases Control would bring together all of the nurses that were in the Lusaka district every Friday and walk through all of the pictures that they have taken of the cases of the services that they had seen in the course of the week and go through like a grand round type of thing and say which one was correct, which patient needed to be called back. 
as we scaled up and people were further away from Lusaka, it was important to do something of a telemedicine, tele-quality control. And so there's this room in Lusaka where we have four uh, screens, computers, and they are connected to all of the centers that are providing see and treat. So if a health worker in a distant location saw a patient and was unsure of what to do, is this really eligible for cryotherapy, or is it too big, or is this suspicious of cancer? They take the picture and they send it to the e-hub room and send a text message to the headquarters, to the people managing the room to say, can you help? And in real time, the e-hub staff would give advice because they see the photo, they use semicography, they see the photo, they're able to give advice on ground to say, yes, this is cryo-eligible, go ahead and treat. No, this is much bigger, refer for lead. No, this is suspicious of cancer. And we're told that in real time, within 30 minutes, the, the health worker in that distant location gets guidance on what to do. The second is supportive supervision. It's built into the training. And so people go back every quarter to work with the team on ground and just make sure that hands-on, correction on the job, training on the job, and improvement of skills. In terms of uh, too many cloud therapy uh, procedures being done, it's actually been proven that it is protective of the woman, even if you do it and she doesn't need it, that it is protective of her cervix. And therefore, for a woman who may never have another opportunity of a pelvic examination, it is not a disadvantage. But what we have also found is the more the health workers practice and see patients the more apt they are in making those kinds of diagnoses. And with the telemedicine support, they get better at it. Would you like to add anything, Kerry? Yes. Um, the, the, the issue of quality was uh, very pivotal in the, in the program. And when we started thinking of scaling up the program, it became very clear to us that we needed to think a little bit outside the box and to see what we can do you know, to, to ensure that, remember we are using nurses, not gyne gynecologic uh, oncologists. So these nurses were supposed to be doing the same thing throughout the country, wherever, whichever site you open. And what Doina said is what exactly happened. We, um, I think the people who developed are the young students from Harvard. Two, two young Harvard students who de helped design the okay, the e-hub the, the e program, and uh, it's 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 got qualitative information built in on where to base decisions on how to treat. But we want to take it to the next step. We want to put a quantitative scoring system on this. If you look at uh, the, the, the program that has been developed by the Swedish uh, doctors, it, there is a sweet score there that they use if they are doing VIA. And uh, it, it guides on who gets cryotherapy, who is negative on VIA, and who needs a lift. So this sort of quantitative scoring is, will be important to add to what we have currently. So we, we, we're beginning to look at how best we can introduce this in that environment to make it even better. But the good thing we, with us is that in Zambia today, internet is, 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 is available in most of the districts today in Zambia, and fiber is beginning to reach almost all districts of Zambia. So here is an advantage that we can take, take off so that we begin to, to, to ensure that the quality remains the same. The overtreatment issues, I think she's, she's said what I needed to say. And um, 
with this being demonstrable uh, using telemedicine from a very remote location. Those days we were having difficulties to comprehend that this can work, but we have demonstrated that it works. So therefore it means that even our centralized pathology can also be decentralized, and these are some of the things that we've put in our National Cancer Control Strategic Plan to ensure that we reduce the turnaround for those having uh, histopathological specimens being examined. And we want to also utilize the same platform, provide histopath labs at lower levels with technologies that can actually produce slides. And these are the slides that are going to be sent to the central location for interpretation. And we are going to reduce on the time to make early diagnosis much more sensible in Zambia. So these are the, the, the things about quality and how it can change, you know, the, 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 the entire service. And we've already demonstrated that it works, and so we want to build more things on it, using cervical cancer as a casing disease, and then strengthening the whole system of delivering the cancer service in Zambia. And Sandy, anything on this question or the question that was put more to you directly? Uh, I think third question. not to this question, but to the one that was put to me uh, more directly is um, about prioritization. And we're certainly um, refocusing and reprioritizing inside um, of PEPFAR to make sure that we're investing um, to get the, the maximum impact um, and the maximum return on our investments. However, that's not to say that we are, while we define uh, some of our activities as core, near core, and non core in our deliberations, doesn't mean we're abandoning or not appreciating how important that those uh, near core and non core for our particular HIV um, AIDS work. Um, so it's, we're not leaving those. I think what this speaks to for us is that we're going to have to be much more um, uh, aggressive and creative in building partnerships. So if we're pivoting um, our PEPFAR activities to, a, to over here, we're not, we don't want to leave anything behind that's undone here. And we're committed to doing that. Certainly, cervical cancer is a big part um, of our work because the majority of people we serve are women. Um, of childbearing age, so we're not abandoning um, our work and, and uh, are more dedicated to, to pink ribbon, red ribbon, and our, our uh, work in, in cervical cancer than, than ever before. But um, it speaks to, I think, scale up and to what happens, you know, now that, we be, that we're beginning to integrate some of these programs, using and leveraging existing platforms, not just PEPFAR's platform, but others, um, to be more creative and, you know, uh, outreach to, to places that are hard to reach and people that are hard to reach. Um, it's forcing us to change, but there's a real evolution in how we're looking at um, public health and in healthcare delivery, not just in HIV, but in cancer and many other um, areas in malaria and tuberculosis and others. So I think it's a, it's a time in our, in our fields that we really have to take more interdisciplinary approaches, that we have to have partnerships that we've never had before. We have to look at creative solutions and innovative solutions that Dwayne was talking about. Um, and so it's, it's, I think uh, the onus is in all, on, upon all of us or on all of us um, to work together to, to, um, to figure out how we um, address these issues um, more collaboratively. It is, um, you know, when you look at what's happening in, in PEPFAR, and I think it's a, it's a really good example, you know, we're almost a victim of our own success that um, in a time where we have um, uh, you know, decreasing budgets, uh, we've put more people on treatment than we ever have had or done in history, um, and, but at some point in time, you know, the money gets tight, and so we're gonna have to get more people to the table, be more efficient than we've ever um, had to be in, in all the time that we've been uh, doing this in the last 35 years. So it's, um, so I, I, would, I just wanna leave you with, we are pivoting, we are taking much more sort of solid public health approaches. We're you know, driving all of our decisions based on data that we really didn't have access to um, in the past uh, years of, of PEPFAR. Um, and do now, and that's, that's changing that we do business, and I think the way we do business, I think there's good news and, and some challenges in that, but I think we're, we're all committed to making sure that we don't leave anybody behind in the process. Now, thank, thanks, Sandy, and I, I just add, Dwayne, correct me if I'm wrong, I think PEPFAR is still the largest single financial contributor to pink 
ribbon, red ribbon, but has supported in so many other ways at country level with technical advice and support and sometimes just the need to get things done. I think everybody understands how hard it is sometimes just make things happen and, right. and PEPFAR teams have been great in helping move that agenda forward. Um, so we are coming up on noon. Steve, can we do one more quick round or what's your advice? Uh, maybe five more minutes. Okay, we have five more minutes. So I had promised this lady over here and then this gentleman, um, and why don't we just stop maybe with those two questions, if that's okay. But I know Doyen and Ken will be around throughout the rest of the day, so if there are other questions, people can, of course, come up to them during the coffee breaks. And it's Marjorie Newman-Williams from PAHO Foundation. Hi, Sandy. Hey. Hi, Doyen. Um, quick question. In the beginning, Doyen referenced Latin America and the Caribbean, and taking this program there will have new challenges because we don't have the strong PEPFAR platform there. So could you just say a little bit more about that plan? Mm -hmm. Okay, and gentlemen here, please. Well, at Jokes University from EU Health Security, first I want to thank CSIS, this has been amazing. But what is next? What, what do you want, what do you expect us to do to amplify all these things that are happening? Because this is not, it's, it's a great lecture, but I want to go into how we can amplify what you're doing. Thank you. So, to the first question, Doyen, should we start? By the way, Twitter has gone crazy with you, so. <laughs> <laughs> so the plans for Latin America, well, the questioner is also a potential partner to us. We are in conversations with PAHO Foundation, and we're going to be exploring Latin America in the next two to three months and the Caribbean will first of all go to Peru and to Jamaica. And as our first step always is, we scope the country to do a quick assessment of the situation in the country, the health systems, the partners that are there, and just identify what the gaps are. We are very conversant that the, the situation in Latin America will be different from what it is in sub-Saharan Africa. But we are ready for that, because as we have partners who promote VIA cryotherapy in sub-Saharan Africa, so we also have partners who are willing to work with us if it's cytology, pap smears, histopathology, we have American Society for the for clinical pathology, if it's advanced cancer care, we have MD Anderson, and so on and so forth. So we are going in with an open mind, and we would apply the same kinds of principles, looking at what the gaps are, which ones we can fill, and then come back to our partners and say, this is what we have found on ground, who is willing to do what? And this is the way we work. We have a, a very, good slide that shows us from prevention right through to palliative care, and you can see where each partner fits along the continuum. And we will do exactly the same thing for Latin America. So all eyes all just out there looking for Latin America and waiting to see what the next steps would be. So you are asking us what is next. I need money. <laughs> <laughs> because one of the things that we are trying to do right now is how do we transition our support as Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon to full national government responsibility. And to be able to do that, we want to get to a comfortable position with the country where he, as the you know, senior medical superintendent, is comfortable with saying, now you have catalyzed action to this point. We have merged what you are doing, and we are comfortable that we can sustain it. But for us to move from where we are now to the point of transitioning to government, we need to infuse a lot more resources to just fill in some gaps within the health systems and make sure that we get the country to a comfortable position where it is a program. We never pro project ourselves as project. We say we are a program because we want to sustain it. So whatever it takes in terms of advocacy, in terms of resources, 
in terms of connecting us to people who are interested in women in Africa, in girls, that can help us to sustain these programs. That's what we are for. Thank, thank you, Doyen. And I think you also answered the second question. But let me see if either Sandy or um, Kennedy, uh, maybe just in terms of a quick 30, 45 second sort of closing thought that would respond both to the question of kind of what's next and my question that I put before, kind of the single thing that is most important about this partnership. And then we'll wrap up and let everybody go to lunch. So. Sure. Well, I, well, I just think that, that all of the work that, that we're talking about in anywhere in the world um, and um, it, is going to require new kinds of partnerships. And I think these kinds of public-private partnerships really are um, the, the key to being able to bring all of our work to scale. And the wonderful thing is that they're different in every region. They're different in every neighborhood. They're different in every country. They're different in every, you know, every place in the world. Um, and our ability to understand that our work has to be done not only on a one-size-fits-all basis, but very, very tailored to the specific challenges and opportunities and places where we're working. And I think that's what's gonna, gonna help us bring all of this to scale. Thank you. Kennedy. Right, what next? At country level for, for, for Zambia, um, it would be interesting for you to note that uh, the government of, of Zambia is busy investing in the in the healthcare system, at this current moment we have uh, 650 uh, clinics being built. They are all under construction at the same time in Zambia, and these are the clinics where they will be very they will be in the community, and these are the clinics that will carry some of these uh, uh, screening services. And if you ask me, what next? What would you want to do? Uh, we will require assistance in terms of making sure that the equipment is available. And uh, some of the, the, the things that we require for training uh, are made available to us so that the whole program becomes successful. Um, I think that uh, with, the, with the strides that government has done to, to, to ensure that we scale up, the partners and, uh, and the rest must actually see it as an opportunity, a low-hanging fruit where we've already done at least so much so that we cover the whole country. So we shall require, as she says, a lot of resources to do it. Join. 30 seconds. Anything oh, else you okay. Add? You want me to say something? Okay. So I think what we need is to wage war against cervical cancer. And it's obvious that no single organization, institution, entity, has all that it takes to wage this war. And so all hands have to be on deck, working together in a public-private partnership model to defeat cervical cancer. Thank you. Thank you, Doyen. And I just say from the point of view of my own organization, UNAIDS, it's been one of the founding partners of Pink River Revenue from the beginning. This is um, a, a, a fight we are committed to, 150%. Um, and I think some of the other panels mentioned the importance of actually moving this forward and making sure it's included in what comes after the Millennium Development Goals and using every single platform we have to advance it. So that's something we'll certainly be focused on. Um, but thank you all very much. You, you were great questions, and thanks for um, being with us. And I guess on to lunch. Is that right, Steve? Yes. Thank you. Thank you.